Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, and also thanks to the organizers for having me here. It's um, really exciting to be able to present my work to such an interdisciplinary audience. So um, I'm very excited by the opportunity. Okay, let's see if that, is that better? Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna be talking about the large scale topography of the ventral visual stream. So my research is really aimed at trying to understand visual representation. How do you take um, actively sensed patterns of light and transform them along the ventral stream into useful representations of objects and agents and the environment around us? Um, and I take as an assumption or, or sort of a precondition that the cortex has a lot of biological organizing mechanisms that really constrain the connectivity, what can be connected to what. It doesn't start out all as one, and, and these really scaffold the kinds of feature tuning that can be learned. Um, and so my work, I try and understand what regions do um, in the context of where they are, why they're organized that way, um, and really try and leverage topography as a clue to the underlying computational role. Um, today, I'm going to talk about object representation, so you can effortlessly um, discriminate amongst these and recognize them from among thousands of different options. So what is the nature of the representation that allows us to do this? And the typical schematic that I think you've probably all seen either in a brain form or in a neural network, uh, artificial neural network form, is something like this. So, you know, information gets relayed through different stages along the ventral stream, retina, transform to LGN, to V1, V2, V3, and onward into object-selective cortex. Um, and so the questions inspired by this diagram are really to try and understand, like, what are the nature of the representations and the transformations between these stages? How many are there? Um, and whether implicitly or explicitly, we often try to think of these as separate stages, perhaps with distinct representational roles, and have the idea that there's a cortical field as a basic organizational unit. I'm going to introduce another schematic of the same thing, but focusing on, instead, the topography. So what tuning is where in a two-dimensional cortical sheet? So here is the medial view of a human hemisphere, partially inflated. It's the back, you can see this is occipital cortex, where early visual cortex lives. It's a sort of um, semicircular bit, bit of cortex, which matches the sort of hemifield of the visual um, yeah, visual hemifield, so you can see that schematized here. And V1 is sort of at the back of the map with V2 and V3 wrapped around it. Um, and running across these maps is a large-scale organization by eccentricity. So cortex that responds to the center of your visual field is here, and cortex that responds to the periphery is sort of wrapped around it like that. And if you go around the bend, so if you take the medial cortex and you rotate it around, so now you're looking at the lateral side, you can see this cortex in yellow is occipitotemporal cortex, and that's where object representation is housed. Um, and it, too, has a posterior to anterior gradient, so that's the hierarchy in dashed lines. But if you look at how information is represented here, we know that there is a mosaic of regions that have um, seem to have responses that are highly specialized for a few specific categories, faces, bodies, scenes, letters. Um, what about other objects? Well, it turns out there is structure in the responses to other objects, though they don't have selective regions in the same way. Um, so if you just show people pictures of things like big objects or animals or small objects presented at the same visual size on the screen, this is the size they would be in the world, their familiar real-world size, um, and what you see is, oops, right, point this way. There is a large-scale organization by this factor. So this cortex here, which you can see in blue, responds more to big objects than the other two categories. And it's adjacent to a cortex that responds more to animate things. And right in the center of the map is a small object preferring cortex. So we have this tripartite mirrored organization for other objects. And actually, the category selective regions for faces and bodies fit kind of within the animate zones. So that sort of makes sense. 
Um, and recently, we've shown um, a little bit about what's going on in this cortex. So is it really about a high-level description of size or animacy? We don't think that's going on. So what we did is texturize these stimuli. So you can see they preserve some of their shape and texture features, but you don't really know what they are. Um, and these differences between this and this and this are enough to still elicit the same large-scale organization across this cortex. Um, so we think what's going on here are sort of it, largely, in part, these mid-level feature differences that are related to high-level differences of animacy and object size. So, when you take a look at this schematic of the visual system, the question is, why? Why these distinctions and not others? Why is it mirrored? How does it come to be this way? Um, and I think there are new insights to be gained um, understanding the nature of the representation by thinking about this alternate schematic. So that's what I'm going to take you through today. Okay, so in the first part, I'm going to go through some theories of why that organization is the way it is, um, and then show you some empirical evidence and some modeling work that are sort of getting at those. And then in the second part, I'm going to show you a modeling framework that we think is going to be useful to go from well-specified representational spaces into topographic predictions. Okay. So this is the theoretical interlude. Um, why does the occipital temporal cortex organization look like that? There are many proposals, but they usually lie along a continuum, so I'm going to characterize the two extremes, and almost everyone is situated somewhere in between them. Um, but the first one, and they're all about connections. How, what's connected to what? They just emphasize different connections. So the first extreme view is that this organization of object responsive cortex is entirely due to input connections. That is, we have early visual cortex mapped like this, and the cortex just um, has this eccentricity organization that gets extended going forward, and then you start to get specialization by object categories. Um, so this was initially proposed by Ori Hassan, Rafi Malik, and Itzhak Levy. Um, we added to it by thinking about real-world size. If you think about the way observers interact with objects in the world, there's just physical constraints and projective geometry that make it the case that small things tend to subtend smaller visual angles, and big things tend to subtend bigger visual angles, and that might naturally array object size along the eccentricity gradient, so it might promote this sort of large-scale distinction. Um, in this view, the cortex is really like kind of a dumb covariance extractor. Um, you basically just need sort of generic local topographic connections, and all you do is take that input and keep getting, you know, extracting features along, and because of that eccentricity gradient, you sort of just naturally give rise to, you know, these kind of distinctions going forward. That's the strong um, experience-driven account. Yeah, so the people who emphasize input connections also tend to be empiricist and suggest that it's sensory experience um, in the lifetime that's really driving the tuning and fu functional clustering of object selective cortex. And not just any sensory experience, it's early sensory experience. We know this by really beautiful studies that use controlled rearing with monkeys or by people who were really fascinated with the game of Pokemon when they were little. Um, so there's clear evidence, <laughs> not kidding, look up that paper, it's quite fun. Okay, so there's clear evidence for experience-driven explanations for why we see the organization that we see. Then there's the other side, and these this camp uh, really focuses on output connections. So we know vision is for something. We don't just see, we see for something. We need to understand what people are doing. We need to r not run into things. We need to know where we're going. We need to interact with objects. And um, so what the visual system should do is not just represent any covariance. It should represent the behaviorally relevant covariance. Well, and how does it know what that is? Well, it's enforced by these long-range networks that are connected to different facets of the system. Um, and this is really a view that focuses instead on the pressures of cortex, uh, or the under evolutionary pressure. Um, and so on this view, it's these sort of long-range network-level connections that are going in and causing certain kinds of selectivities to be where they are. Um, and there's also clear evidence from, for this account um, for congenitally blind um, people who have never had visual experience. They tend to have similar kinds of tuning, or sorry, responses to different kinds of information, um, despite having never seen anything. So both seem to be true, and now it's a big debate of like the, mat the degree and timing and relative commitment of each of, uh, role of each of these connections. So in this account, innate network architecture builds in distinct processing routes, and these lead to the specializations that we see. 
So I'm going to give you, there's a lot of different people who have looked at um, evidence for both of these, but I'm going to just show you one bit of data that we did um, that's really focused on these with respect to the animacy size organization. Um, and specifically, we just did a resting state study as a proxy for connectivity. Um, also, as a caveat, this is in adults and not kids or babies, which is really when these pressures would be relevant, but at least we can model the adult state and see what kind of insights we can get from that. Okay, so to do this, we did the simplest thing you could think of, which is for each subject, we just mapped their animacy and size organization and defined five seed regions, one in each of those big zones. And then we measured the brain during rest, well, rest, um, <laughs> with eyes closed. Um, and then for each of these seed regions, we looked at the fluctuations over time, correlate that with all the other voxels in the brain, we repeat that for every single seed region, and now we can just ask, hey, do these regions correlate with really distinct long-range networks? Here are the results from that analysis. I'll just draw your attention to the occipital temporal cortex in the back, where you can see that basically every single seed seeds the whole occipital temporal cortex. There are some differences, but these look mostly similar. Um, and you can quantify that, so every voxel that's uh, red, uh, pardon me, <laughs> yellow is one that's, you know, that that's in the network of all five of the of seed regions, and you can see basically all of occipitotemporal cortex is correlated at rest. Okay, so then we had to do something a little bit more complicated. What if you look for differences, can you find them? So we did this data-driven profile clustering analysis, so here's the logic of it. So for each voxel outside of occipitotemporal cortex, we got how correlated it was with each of the five seed regions. So this voxel, for instance, responds most to the small objects, or correlates most with small object regions and less with the other ones. Okay, we can do that for all the voxels, um, and we can do that for all our subjects. And then what we want to do is select the voxels that have a distinctive profile that correlates more with some re seed regions than others in a consistent way across subjects. Now, that's nice because it doesn't specify what kind of profile, like it could like these three and not those two, or it could have a ramping, like there's lots of possible ways you can differentially correlate among these regions. And so to get a sense of what was going on there, we used a k-means clustering analysis to discover the groups of voxels that had similar profiles so we could see what they, what they were correlated with. And then we ran this in a replication experiment to make sure what we found was real. Um, so let me walk you through the results. Um, we found that across, var varying the number of clusters in both the main and replication experiment, that a three-cluster solution was best. If you look at the cluster, say cluster one, these are voxels outside occipitotemporal cortex that correlate most strongly with both of the big object regions ra rather than the other two. And if you look where they are, you see extensive peripheral visual cortex, um, retrosplenial into peripacampal. Second cluster correlated more with both animate regions and less so with the inanimate regions. If you look at where those voxels were, they basically extend entirely along the superior temporal sulcus. And finally, the last cluster so, you know, correlated most strongly with the small object region, and you can see basically extensively along the dorsal stream. So in a way, we've got this like, huge factorization where like, the whole medial surface is related more to big objects, scene regions, the whole like, lateral temporal with animate regions, and the whole dorsal stream with small objects. So, and, and that was, we didn't build that in. That was a data-driven result that showed even in the network connectivity, in terms of the profiles, this tripartite distinction naturally emerges. So back to our experimental question, to what extent is this animacy size organization reflected by distinct resting state networks? There are distinct networks that route through occipitotemporal cortex. And I think this shows that there's um, some evidence for the possibility of long-range network-guided organization. Um, and this includes not just you know, beyond the visual system, but also um, differences with early con uh, connectivity in um, early visual cortex. But the local interconnected network was actually the dominant one in the resting state structure, which is not what we were expecting, um, which suggests maybe that the internal structure within the occipitotemporal cortex itself might be contributing to the clustering and segregation of object responses in maybe a self-organizing type way.
So maybe there's a third source of organizational pressure that hasn't received as much attention. So we have input connections here, output co connections here, but maybe there's a lot of interconnections within this cortex that help make sure that things stay orderly and separated. And that's actually got a lot of surprising implications because when we think about saying, like, what does FFA do or what does PPA do, we don't usually think about how they're related to each other at all. They're studied by completely separate communities. We think they have really different kinds of features underlying them. But, you know, this by implication would suggest that, oh, maybe there are connections or a relationship between them that we haven't noticed. So here's a hypothesis then. Um, perhaps the occipital temporal cortex as a whole is actually reflecting a really common, large-scale shape space that's sort of separating out all the ways that things can be different from each other. So here's a schematic of that, where what you're trying to do is learn features that like, kind of separate all the things from everything else so you can represent and perceive all the different kinds of shapes you might see in your world. And then, um, interestingly, this is not too unlike what deep nets are doing. So if you take AlexNet trained on ImageNet, what does it do but learn a bunch of convolutional filters in service of a thousand-way object categorization. And the way the you know, filters are set up, they have to be kind of common because they're shared across the layers. So in a way, it's like trying to learn all of these ma massively discriminative features um, to sort of separate all the possible objects you could see in the world. And on that view, then, you know, FFA is maybe, or, you know, face selective tuning might stick out um, in sort of the, but still be a part of something that's sort of more common across all the different regions. And what's really exciting is now we have tools to test these hypotheses in ways that we hadn't before. So I'm just going to give you like a little taste of ongoing work um, in the lab that's trying to get at this question. So this is a project by um, an undergraduate. So if you're looking for graduate students, keep an eye out. Um, um, empirical evidence for a common feature space. So what he did was to define deep net face regions. What do I mean by that? So we took an AlexNet, we trained it on ImageNet. And then we basically did fMRI on it. So we showed it face images and recorded responses from every unit to faces and to scenes. And then we did a t-test, just like we do with voxels. And then we FDR corrected each layer. If for aficionados, that means something to you. Um, and now for each layer, what we can do is basically define a, like, a deep net face area, which is a selection of units that have um, two, you know, higher responses to faces over scenes. So for the purpose of this, I'm just going to focus on pool five, which is right at the end of the convolutions before you get to fully connected, which is a smallish number of neurons there. So now we can ask, you know, do object-trained deep net face regions match FFA responses in brains? So this is from a data set where we had um, activations to eight different categories. So in human FFA, you can see it has the strongest response to faces. This is bodies and cats, so other animate things are kind of in the middle, and then less so for inanimate categories. If you show those same images to the deep net face area, um, we also see that it likes faces more than the other things. Um, these are moderately correlated, uh, but it's eight points, and we kind of put this in, so I see this mostly as a sanity check. Hey, we defined it with some stimuli, and then we showed it different stimuli, like grayscale, they were very different kind, but we see, sort of see this selectivity. So we passed the first test. This is where it gets interesting. So then we looked at the representational similarity of the patterns in FFA. So that is, taking the voxels in FFA, how similar are the patterns of activation between faces and bodies, faces and cats, faces and chairs, faces and hammers, etc. So that's there. And we did the same thing with the units in the deep net face area and found a really strong correlation. So that's surprising because if you think FFA is really doing face discrimination and only is caring about the difference between faces. It's not obvious how a deep net face area defined in this way, AlexNet doesn't even actually have a face category, though it sees lots of them with other categories, but in any case, um, these are much more generic features and we seem to be capturing a decent amount of the structure. 
And so I actually think this is going to be a useful way forward in making sense of some of the puzzles that are hidden in the category selective regions. Like they're clearly category selective, but they have this structure to other categories. Why? And maybe the answer is something like, well, it's about di they're discriminative. It's trying to separate faceness from everything else. And so you get signatures of the other objects that are consistent. Um, so they're really more discriminative features. Um, so yeah, I think we can start to make sense of some of the puzzles um, going on here. OK, so we have an emerging picture, um, if you'll grant me some leeway, um, where the idea is, well, maybe what's going on is there's sort of a common representational goal that occipital temporal cortex is trying to solve. And that's to learn features that separate all categories from all other categories. And that's something that you have to do jointly. And in a way, it's sort of like a, a very large-scale population code. And that's you know, it's reminiscent of exactly um, you know, Haxby's ideas that there's a form topology across occipital temporal cortex. But what I think is going on is that it's spatially mapped topographically in, in a smooth way. Um, and that's for readout. And this goes back to the wiring problem, which is if it's a big population code and you want to read out information from it from another region, that's a lot of wires you got to go connect the whole bank, like, that, there's a lot of wires. So instead, if you route your wires to different parts of the population code, then you might be able to get a high fidelity signal from some of the categories. In particular, we think that's the high firing rates that are like signaling the content for that part of the population code. And this is kind of an interesting idea because I think it points to a mid to high level conversion. For instance, this region, has two roles. In terms of its local network, you can think of it as participating in a sort of discriminative shape space. But in terms of its long-range network, it's actually signaling, there's a face here, it's signaling high-level content. So the same region, I think, is doing both mid-level and high-level processing. Um, one missing piece for this uh, story is, great, OK, how do you go from something like this to something like that? Um, how do you take a feature space and make it a smooth topography? And this is um, also important because ultimately what we measure, measure with fMRI are spatialized responses. And it would be really nice if our hypotheses about the feature space were realized in sort of spatialized predictions to match the kind of signal we're measuring. Um, we don't exactly know what this feature space is, and we're still working out the details of this topography, so rather than start there, um, in the next part, I'm going to tell you about how we started in an easier problem, which is to try and understand the large-scale organization of V1, V2, V3, which we have a very clear understanding of how things are mapped, and we have a um, certainly much more clear understanding of the tuning. All right. so. Part two, modeling the large-scale organization of early visual cortex. So we know early visual cortex has multiple visual areas. For now, I'm just going to focus on V1, V2, V3. They go on and on and on, but that's another story. So we'll just focus on sort of these main ones. Why? The standard story is that they're sort of distinct representational stages. They have different roles, and they promote a visual feature hierarchy. But when you look at how they're organized on the cortex, it's strange. We've got this big V1. Hold on, I'm losing my pointer. There it is. OK. This like tiny strip of V2 wrapped around it, and then a tiny strip of V3 wrapped around that. And the people who do mapping have noticed that this is a really consistent super aerial organization. There's never variance at the border between these areas. It's really smooth. Um, and so they've suggested that maybe these actually participate in a common functional role. Or maybe not, maybe this and this. They're not exclusive possibilities, but maybe there's a larger purpose than just separate stages. OK. So um, I'm just going to dig in a little bit to give you a little more detail into what's going on and how information is mapped across this cortex. So the way we, you interpret these pictures is here's a um, visual field, and each point is colored with a different color. And then here, um, you can imagine there's a population of neurons that have a receptive field, so you can understand what parts of the visual field the cortex is responding to by referring over to here. Um, and so what you can see is that there's these major large-scale motifs that are common across all the areas. Oh, yeah. So we've got, oh, yeah, there we go. 
Um, so you can see there's a lower visual field and an upper visual field. That's a major division. Um, there's the fovea to periphery organization that you, I've talked about. Um, and actually, this is often schematized like so, where people, you look at how you map from the vertical to horizontal meridian. So the horizontal meridian is always here, um, and then it goes vertical, horizontal, vertical. So the visual field kind of has these mirrored alternations. And that's actually, we actually define the areas by looking for those alternations. So this is like the, the Pac-Man model. So why? Why is it organized like that? Um, why isn't it like this or embedded? What's going on? We really need a method to predict how information is mapped across the cortex to get any sense of the answer. And so I'm going to bring back a super old <laughs> method, um, which um, is called Cajonan maps or self-organizing maps. And this is an algorithm that has a really nice form. It's exactly the form that we want, which is you have to give it an input of a high-dimensional representational space, and you run it through the self-organizing map algorithm, and it gives you out a two-dimensional cortex where each unit in the simulated cortex has tuning somewhere in this high-dimensional space, and nearby units have similar tuning. So the algorithm works to make sure that the units nearby it end up nearby in this representational space. And the idea here is that this enables local computations in the parameter space to be carried out by local circuits in the cortex. So you can kind of easily say, hey, I might do like a center surround and not take too many wires to get that done. Um, and this has been used successfully in modeling the fine-scale organization of V1 and the large-scale organization of the motor system. Um, and so here we're going to try the large-scale organization of the visual system. And so the question then is, what is the high-dimensional representational space that when you smoothly map it, gives rise to this large-scale organization that I just showed you? And to give you some intuitions about how the self-organizing map works before I get into visual areas, I'm going to just show you in a color wheel. So what you specify as input is a feature matrix. That is, it's got a lot of points among some dimensions. So each color you can represent as RGB, so three different dimensions. I put 100 points in here. So each point is a sample in the space. So one point is a color. Um, and you can see these are the samples in my world. This is my high dimensional space, 3D, so you can visualize it. Um, one thing to note is that there's lots more possible colors in this world that I could have put in, but nope, in this world, these are the only colors that exist in this space. Okay, and when you run it through the algorithm, what you get out is a tuned map. So say seven units by seven units by three dimensions. Each one has tuning in RGB. Since that's just color, we can replace it by the color it is. And you can see we get a nice color wheel. I mean, we can visualize where each unit falls in the representational space. So each black dot here is a unit in the map. And you can see that really these map units sort of hug the data. They don't spend any of their representational resources representing bits of color space that you don't have, you know, that your world doesn't live in. Except for this one guy, he got stuck. He's gray. He got stuck equally distant from all the other colors. So it's a nice way because it lets you only put your representational resources where your data are and not waste time coding other bits of the representational space. Okay, so let's start simple. We're going to create a single visual area. And the key idea to make this work was to code for space implicitly. Let me try and say what I mean there. So instead of dimensions of space being x and y, that would be like two-dimensional space with two dimensions, instead we're going to code space with points. So I, if I have 20 eccentricity steps and 20 angular rays, that's 400 dimensions. And the samples in this, 400-dimensional space are going to be Gaussian pooling regions. So, for instance, this is one that's got high weights on some of the dimensions and low weights on others. So you can just take this and sort of string it out, and that's a 400-dimensional vector in a 400-dimensional space. And if I make pooling regions at different locations, you can see how there's a bunch of um, different vectors we're making. Um, and so a uh, feature matrix would be, say, 400 points centered in the 400-dimensional uh, space. With me so far? Yeah, it's the end of the day. Just roll with it. It'll be fine. OK. So each row corresponds to a sample. OK, so what happens when you 
run this through the self-organizing math algorithm. Oh, first, you can just visualize what this space looks like. It's four dimensions, so this is three principal components. But you can see it basically maps out a really smooth manifold in the space, and that makes sense given that like we stitched it very nicely with nice pooling regions. So there is a low-dimensional manifold. It's just hidden in a 400-dimensional space. And um, the self-organizing map finds it. So what you get out is a map where each unit is tuned in that 400-dimensional space, which we can visualize. Oh, that one has a foveal receptive field. That one has an upper visual field lower visual field. So what we do is for each unit, we fit a 2D Gaussian so we can find its receptive field center. And then we just plot the simulated map in the exact same way we plot retina tapi if we're doing it in brains. Um, and so you can see that we have a nice fovea to periphery organization. We have the divide by upper and lower. This is basically a visual area. Um, and you can effectively see that this map just sort of hugs that low dimensional manifold. Um, in a way, this is like if this didn't work, something went wrong in the self organizing map algorithm. Okay. So, oh, if you're wondering why the map is nice and semicircular, it's because the hemifield is that way, and you can set the map shape. So I made it look that way so it's prettier, but it's, it actually doesn't change anything. Okay. So, how do you create multiple visual areas? Um, and the insight here is that a useful basis for natural scene processing is to capture information from all locations at multiple spatial scales. So the image pyramid um, from computer vision. And we also know this cortex has really systematic receptive field size. So as you go along in eccentricity in each of the areas, they increase in receptive fields. So how do we define a multi-scale filter bank? Um, same logic, just scaled up. So here we have um, 820 visual field locations, a little higher resolution. Um, here are samples from eight different scales of receptive fields. And I've just shown you one with the same center, but we put one at every visual field location. So what we end up with is 600, about 6,000 samples in this 820-dimensional space. OK. So what happens when we run this through the self-organizing map? Same thing. You get a map. You fit the 2D Gaussian curves for each unit, plot them by polar angle and eccentricity, and we see this. So you, and this is the um, brain data schematic for comparison. So we see for polar angle, the large-scale motifs are there. You can see this division between lower, lower and upper visual field. You can see you know, fovea to periphery organization. And what we didn't expect to find right away, but there it is, you see the alternations. You see it goes from you know, horizontal to vertical to horizontal to vertical. So in effect, we get multiple mirrored maps or areas naturally emerging from trying to map this multi-scale filter bank smoothly onto a cortex. And the surprising thing was we didn't need to put any hierarchy in there. There's no hierarchical features or feature complexity dimensions. This just emerged from the constraints of a multi-scale filter bank. So how does receptive field size relate to eccentricity? This is maybe to try and give some intuitions for why this happens. Um, so if you look down here, the smallest receptive field size ends up kind of at the center, and that's because those are the tightest similarity relationships to satisfy. And then the bigger receptive fields just end up kind of wrapping around it because those are a little easier to satisfy and be similar to. But you have to kind of fold through it because it's more dimensions than fits in a 2D cortex. So that's why you end up getting these alternations um, to cover the horizontal and vertical um, sweep. OK. And so we also see that same relationship that the receptive field size is correlated with the eccentricity. OK. We did a bunch of different robustness checks. What if you try different multi-scale filter banks, map sizes? Um, Here's a bunch of examples. Um, from playing around with this giant parameter space, the take-homes I found so far is that you can really get fewer or more areas of different relative sizes depending on how you spec, spec out that multi-scale space. Sometimes if a scale is too far from its neighbors, you'll get a little satellite map somewhere else, which sometimes maybe happens in mouse cortex. So maybe there's something interesting to bring this method over there. Um, but for the most part, within a range, you almost always get this upper to lower visual field se separation and um, fovea to periphery. So the main result is that this multi-scale filter bank is sufficient to give rise to the mirrored map organization. Visual areas emerge without requiring any explicit hierarchical feature dimensions. So back to our question, why do we have 
this spatial organization. And this diagram often rep, um, sort of emphasizes distinct representational roles, but what I just showed you provides evidence that this common representational goal can account for the entire topography across these areas. Um, and that is to compute a multi-scale filter representation and make it explicit, to take that implicit thing and make it explicit um, in the topography. Okay, implications. Does that mean that V1 and V2 and V3 are totally arbitrary divisions, just how it happened to fold through the map? I think that's far too strong. I don't think you should take that away. Um, I think there's lots of evidence for a feature hierarchy and how these are related to each other. Um, but I think maybe something that you could take away is that feature hierarchy may just not be the major organizing factor. Maybe feature hierarchy is an emergent property that comes from this more basic and primitive um, organizing factor of the multi-scale pooling regions. So this gets to whether we should think of this as a normative or a mechanistic level of explanation for why the cortex is the way it is. And I often tend to the normative side when I, side when I think about this result. That is, like, if you have a multi-scale filter bank and you want to map it smoothly, under the constraints that similar things go nearby, then self-organizing map is a useful approximation to whatever's optimal, people have shown that, and you end up with something like what we see in the cortical sheet. But interestingly, the self-organizing map algorithm was actually inspired, so it's, it's approximation to optimal, because to optimally do that, you have to shuffle things around, which doesn't really happen, you don't shuffle neurons around in, uh, in brains. So the way that the algorithm actually works was actually inspired by developmental mechanisms. So now it becomes interesting to speculate if there's a real link there. And the main things that you need are two things. You need an initial eccentricity gradient, um, and then you need to show it a bunch of samples, basically, uh, in effect, like retinal waves, which we know happen. Um, so I think there's very interesting links trying to take the mechanisms that the self-organizing map works by and um, compare them to developmental mechanisms. And there is evidence for this initial eccentricity gradient happening um, uh, in this area ahead of time, which serves as the guidance for LGN um, uh, uh, you know, axons to go in. To summarize, um, in part one, I told you about the different theories for the large-scale organization of object selective cortex. Um, I showed you some data that there are distinctive subnetworks that route through this animacy size organization, but that these object regions also are part of a common local network. And that has a lot of interesting implications for how we think about the cortex. And I've started to put some initial data out there that suggests, well, maybe this is a different way of thinking about what the features are in these regions um, with an initial proof of concept and a lot more work to do there. And then in the second part, I tried to introduce a framework that we can take these high-dimensional representational spaces and make topographic predictions, which is so that we can match them with the brain, with the fMRI data. Um, and with a case study of early visual cortex, where we learned that if you have to map a representational space that's multi-scale filter bank, you naturally get multiple mirrored maps of V1 and V2 and V3. Um, and just to bring it back to the beginning, these are really contrasting schematics and ways of thinking about how information is processed through the visual system. Um, and I think some of the work here maybe might make you rethink a little bit that feature hierarchy and, and why it is the way it is or how it happens. We can think of V1, V2, V3 as having a common computational role. Um, and OTC, occipital temporal cortex, is also maybe having a common uh, representational role. And then the tuning might emerge from there. And that doesn't easily map with different stages. You can see that the hierarchy kind of runs orthogonal to these major divisions in the tuning. Um, and then I also tried to make the case for why topography might matter for brains and not just be an accident, and that's the wiring problem. It's hard to have everything connected to everything else. It doesn't start out that way. In fact, all that evolution has to operate on is genes that tweak gradients that guide axons. Um, so in a way, thinking about the wiring is, I think, a really important constraint. Um, and the idea that I put forward is that um, by mapping this space, it's a way to take implicit information and make it explicit in the readout. So a population code is 
a mid-level, say, oh, let me see this again. So this might reflect a mid-level population code, but also a high-level content code um, in, that the in a sort of labeled line kind of way, where high firing rates actually signal information. All right, I would like to thank my lab, the funding. Um, thank you very much for hanging in there to the very end of the last keynote. And um, if you're interested in applying to grad school uh, or looking for summer research, um, contact me. Thank you very much. <laughs>
you finish this exploration and you set all the parameters that you think are best suited to explain the way it is in the normal brain. Is there something that experimentalists could do to then make a, a radical prediction, like controlled rearing experiments or destroying part of cortex so that the real estate that the map develops over changes? What would be that sort of suggested uh, test, experimental test. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's starting to get into how we can use like deep nets plus mapping them to then see like can you predict control controlled rearing data or something. I mean, you can do things with deep nets like never show them faces or like really restrict the kinds of categories and so it seems like there's a lot of room to do that and self-organizing maps have this property where and if you, they respond to the frequency of the data. So if you have a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of faces, you're going to get a lot of representational resources to that. So they kind of grow and shrink with experience. Um, and so I think that, they're, that it's amenable to experimental um, uh, traction there. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So I haven't even thought that far ahead yet, but I definitely think that it's it, very easy, even possible. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you get this distinction between V1 and V2, just essentially based on receptive field sizes. Uh, but of course, there's also differences that are between them beyond that, right? So for example, you know, Simon Celli and uh, Mofshan and colleagues have shown how they respond differently versus naturalistic versus just noise images and uh, when they are otherwise matched for low level statistics. And so do you think that you can somehow bring that into your fold? Yeah, that's a really good, okay, so let me see if I understood the, you know, so if you take a, a, a neuron in V1 that has a certain receptive field size that's sort of in the periphery, so it's like medium size, and then you take one in V2 that's closer to the fovea and also, so has the match receptive field size, you're saying there's really different feature tuning in those, so if it's, if feature tuning is purely emerging from receptive field size, we already have empirical data that says that's not the case. Did everyone follow? Okay, so what does this theory say about that? It's a, I think it's a challenge. I think one thing that this theory has, has nothing to say about, so it's a miracle that it worked, um, is like how, like how do you build V2 gets built from V1, like it's not like the LG, I've been trying to find this out, does LGN project to V2 too? Um, or it like is, is V2 really only built from V1? And so I think that, that um, like there's maybe another constraint that you could put in that's really thinking about a more constructivist view of the areas. This, so that's where I'm like, okay, I, I, I hearken back to like, let me just go back to my normative stance. Like without trying to think about building it, if you had to map this, you'd end up with something, you know, with the same form we see. That you get there without having to think about how it's built, I find phenomenally interesting, and I do not know the answer to that question. But there's clear evidence for a hierarchy. That's, that's, that's why you shouldn't take away that the hierarchy isn't real. Yes, good, thank you. Let's take one more. Um, I think I have nearly the same question, but I'd like to ask it a slightly different way. All right, um, uh -oh. <laughs> Well, uh, I have the microphone, so I'll ask it. You do um, it. <laughs> the, the question is, how, how has this work changed the way that you think about the differences in anatomical connections, um, you know, different cells being involved in lateral versus um, intercortical connections? Yeah, okay, so there's something really interesting with the self-organizing map algorithm because when the space isn't perfectly smooth, you have to make decisions. You have to be like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to detour here, and then I'm going to loop back around. And if I had more dimensions, these could be next to each other, but I don't, so they have to be a little bit farther apart than they should be. And that is where you need a long-range connection. So actually, you can take how the manifold fits in the space and go, oh, the, it, you know, say you had to perfectly reconstruct the similarity things, but you don't get to, then, you know, that spot here, well, when it gets flattened out, you're going to need a wire that connects it. So I actually think this algorithm will make very specific predictions about the kind of wiring that's going to happen within the um, module. I don't think it says anything about how it, wiring happens outside the module. Like, again, I actually didn't even think this was going to work because it's just an encapsulated V1, V2, V3. We don't have, it's not even interfacing with anything else, and it's working. So, so somehow, that's one miraculous thing. And then it doesn't, you know, it's like working without any external 
uh, network connections, so it doesn't speak too much to that. But it says a lot about internal connections, which I think is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Let's thank Tali again. Yeah.